I am coming to another important requirement of secondary refining. First, I have talked about decarburization. That means, sorry, I have talked about deoxidation rather. That means the oxygen level in liquid steel has to be brought down. Then I have talked about the sulfur in liquid steel has to be brought down because if there is good amount of sulfur, residual sulfur, you have more amount of manganese sulfide in steel or maybe calcium sulfide in steel. So, this will create sulfide inclusions. So, the inclusion content is more, cleanliness is affected. So, first deoxidation, next step is desulfurization. Now, I talk about degassing. Why degassing is necessary? Because I have told you earlier that hydrogen, nitrogen as gaseous elements which are present in liquid steel. So, they have to be removed. You know, they have to be brought down to a tolerable level. How it is done? It is done by degassing. Now, let us look at it. What do I mean by degassing? Hydrogen, nitrogen, they are present in steel as soluble hydrogen and nitrogen as element. Now, from this hydrogen, nitrogen from the solid steel, it must go to the surface of the solid steel and then will get transformed to the gas hydrogen and nit nitrogen. This is the way hydrogen is transformed that means, hydrogen as element in dissolved in liquid steel must get transferred to the surface and then only it is possible to remove this as hydrogen gas at the liquid steel gas interface it is possible. So, first hydrogen in liquid steel must get transferred to the surface. Then at the surface this uh, you know reaction takes place. Similarly, nitrogen in liquid steel must, must get transferred to the from the bulk to the surface and the surface this reaction will take place. That means, atomic nitrogen, elemental nitrogen will go to the you know molecular nitrogen as gas and removed as gas from the surface. So, you know what are the activity coefficients? Henrian activity coefficient of hydrogen is equal to the reaction constant K H into partial pressure of hydrogen to the power half. You know hydrogen is a gas here. So, what is the activity of hydrogen? It is partial pressure of hydrogen. Because you do not have only hydrogen, there may be there are other gaseous constituents like when you were talking of you know atmosphere there may be hydrogen, there may be nitrogen, there may be hydrogen is getting generated. So, as the partial pressure is important. Similarly, for nitrogen for this reaction nitrogen as element to nitrogen and gas at the liquid steel and gas you know surface interface this reaction is taking place. So, hydrogen present as elemental hydrogen the activity of hydrogen and nitrogen in liquid steel is equal to the equilibrium constant into partial pressure of either hydrogen or nitrogen to the power half. So, these relations indicate that soluble hydrogen and nitrogen, these are soluble hydrogen and nitrogen, these are Henrian activity and as I have told you for this amount the, because it is a dilute solution that means, hydrogen and nitrogen equal still contents are very low in ppm level. So, we can assume them the Henrian law is effective we can assume them to be almost equal to the weight percent of hydrogen and nitrogen. So, this weight percent of hydrogen and nitrogen at equilibrium at any particular temperature can be found out if we know the partial pressure of hydrogen or nitrogen. Now, you try to understand what these relations get. These relations indicate that soluble hydrogen nitrogen equal steel will be low under vacuum under vacuum means partial pressure is coming down. Vacuum means partial pressure of all the gases are coming down, is it not? Is it not so? So, hydrogen also will come down partial pressure, nitrogen also will come down. So, all partial pressures will come down in the process it will help removal of hydrogen as hydrogen gas, removal of nitrogen as nitrogen gas. So, from this K H and K N figures these are all equilibrium constants which are possible to get from the thermodynamic calculations. So, we know what are the possibilities of 
getting you know hydrogen soluble hydrogen and nitrogen at some partial pressure or at some vacuum level. So, this theoretical these are all theoretical calculations this theoretical solubility at different pressure from the k values at any particular temperature are possible. So, let us now try to get some quantitative figures I have mentioned here at 1600 degree centigrade we can from the k values we know these k values are dependent on temperature. So, from thermodynamics we can get at 1600 centigrade what is the k h and k n and at that particular pressure say at normal atmospheric pressure that means, when the atmospheric pressure is 1 then what is the soluble hydrogen what is the soluble nitrogen these are theoretical calculations these indicate that if you use normal pressure that means, if you do not use vacuum. So, at normal atmospheric pressure solubility of hydrogen will be around 5 ppm solubility of nitrogen will be about 50 ppm. If you have more amount of nitrogen more than 50 ppm some amount will try to come out you know from this liquid steam because the limit is this. Now, we can bring it down just look at the figures when we go to vacuum that means, you know what is called torr. one torr is 1 millimeter of mercury one atmospheric pressure is equivalent to 760 millimeter of mercury column that means, at 1 millimeter of mercury column that means, at 1 torr look at the figures hydrogen can come down to 1 ppm nitrogen can come down to 15 ppm. So, it is very clear by using vacuum we can degas the liquid steel we can bring down the hydrogen nitrogen contents in liquid steel the process is called degassing. So, we must create vacuum in the process. So, in whatever process there is vacuum there is a possibility of degassing there is a possibility of controlling or reducing you know soluble hydrogen and nitrogen in liquid steel which is an important requirement for getting a good quality of steel because the gaseous contents if they are present more than a critical values they can create problem during casting they can create problem during subsequent you know applications. So, I have just tried to give you an indication that how by using vacuum we can get good degassing we can get relatively good amount of degassing the dissolved hydrogen and nitrogen can be brought down by using vacuum. Now, the reaction as I have told you is basically transfer of hydrogen in liquid steel to the surface and the reaction is taking place at the surface and whenever whatever gas is forming they also have to be removed from the liquid steel gas surface to the gaseous phase to the gas you know phase. So, that means, there are three stages now I will come what these figures are giving you are basically the theoretical limits theoretical you know solubility limits theoretical calculations based on thermodynamics it does not take into account the kinetics. Now, if you go into the stages how these reactions are taking place that means, if you involve kinetics then we will see whatever theoretical values we are trying to get some of them may not be possible to achieve in reality. So, if we now talk of kinetics we will come to find that hydrogen. So, whatever theoretical age value theoretical hydrogen solubility you have calculated in reality the actual hydrogen also more or less similar that is not much of a problem that means, theoretical value whatever we have calculated you know here that means, at say 1 torr we have calculated the theoretical hydrogen is possible to bring it down to 1 ppm at this level of vacuum. So, in reality it is possible to get 1 ppm of hydrogen at a vacuum level of 1 torr almost equal that means, it is possible in that order, but nitrogen removal you know degassing of nitrogen is not that efficient why I will come to it now and I am just mentioning here like unlike hydrogen where it is possible to get about 80 90 percent you know to the 80 90 percent of the theoretical uh, level of 
degassing here degassing of nitrogen is only to the extent of 30 percent maximum say 40 percent. So, this is difficult because of the slow kinetics. Now, let us see what are the steps as I have told that nitrogen first has to be or hydrogen also first has to be there has to be a mass transfer of this atomic or nitrogen or hydrogen in liquid steel from the bulk to the surface of the steel to the interface of you know liquid steel and gas this is the first step. Then the surface chemical reaction will happen that means, as I was telling you this reaction will happen that means, atomic hydrogen will give rise to gaseous hydrogen atomic nitrogen will give rise to gaseous nitrogen. So, this reaction is the next step after that that means, whenever atomic nitrogen is forming gaseous nitrogen then this mass transfer of nitrogen in the gas phase is also another step. If it remains at the interface then the reaction will be slower you know further reaction is difficult. So, this must get removed there has to be a mass transfer. Now, these three steps they are rate controlled the whole reaction is rate controlled that means, that they are controlled by these three steps which are relatively slower for nitrogen compared to hydrogen. That is the basic difference between nitrogen and hydrogen. Hydrogen you all of us know they are very small in atomic size they, they are diffusivity very fast. So, this mass transfer of hydrogen is faster mass transfer of hydrogen gas in the gas phase is also faster, but nitrogen relatively slower its diffusion. So, mass transfer of relatively slower compared to hydrogen. So, mass transfer of nitrogen in liquid steel is slower mass transfer of nitrogen in gas also is slower. Moreover, this reaction of from nitrogen atom to nitrogen gas at the interface is also slow because of the presence of oxygen and sulfur. We know that oxygen and sulfur are surface active that means, if oxygen and sulfur are present in liquid steel there will always be some oxygen and sulfur in liquid steel we are trying to deoxidize we are trying to desulfurize, but it, it is not 0 it is some equilibrium values are obtained. So, it is near to those values. So, whatever oxygen and sulfur are present in liquid steel they will compete with nitrogen atoms to go to the surface between liquid steel and gas. So, there is a competition. So, since oxygen and sulfur are very surface active possibility of oxygen and sulfur going more at the interface is relatively large. So, in competition oxygen sulfur they are successful nitrogen becomes a bit unsuccessful. So, that is why not only the transfer of nitrogen is slow transfer of nitrogen liquid steel is slightly slower compared to hydrogen, but they are also the reaction that means, from nitrogen to nitrogen gas at surface also slow because many of the sites are already occupied by oxygen and sulfur. So, therefore, more is oxygen and sulfur in liquid steel less will be the nitrogen at the surface. So, here again control of oxygen and sulfur is coming into picture. So, I have tried to explain here why first decarburization is necessary that means, rather deoxidation is necessary that means, we are trying to control oxygen to very low level this helps in good desulfurization that means, we are controlling sulfur also to some low ex, uh, level in liquid steel. Now, if you have low oxygen and low sulfur in liquid steel. So, the competition from these two elements from these two elements to nitrogen is relatively less. So, there is a possibility of more nitrogen going to the interface. So, if more nitrogen can go there is a more probability of the, the you know liquid steel gas reaction from nitrogen as element to nitrogen and gas will be more. So, this rate controlling step here you know the slow surface reaction will be slightly faster. So, it is always necessary to control oxygen and sulfur for efficient removal of nitrogen. So, this is one important requirement for getting good denitrogenation.
in liquid steel, degassing of nitrogen in liquid steel. The oxygen and sulfur, soluble oxygen and sulfur must be low. That means, there has to be good deoxidation, there has to be good desulfurization, then only we should go for degassing. That is the reason, you know there is a sequence of reactions, there is a sequence of processes for secondary refining. First there is deoxidation, then only you will get good desulfurization. As I have explained to you earlier, if you have low amount of dissolved oxygen in, ox, uh, in liquid steel, then only it is possible to transfer sulfur. That means, transfer of sulfur from liquid steel to slag will be faster when we have low amount of soluble oxygen in liquid steel. I have already discussed just few minutes back this aspect. Now, when the good amount of deoxidation is there, then good amount of desulfuration will be there. When both of these are complete, that means we have very low oxygen and sulfur in liquid steel, then only we should go for degassing and then we can get relatively better amount of degassing of nitrogen. So, whatever theoretical values I was discussing, like you know at one torr we must get theoretically about 15 ppm nitrogen or 1 ppm hydrogen. For hydrogen as I have mentioned is not a problem. Hydrogen more or less theoretical and in realistic situations are more or less similar. But for nitrogen normally we do not get so low soluble nitrogen at 1 torr. It may be 30, it may be 40 ppm. Even at you know at 1 atmospheric pressure this nitrogen level is relatively more because you know as I have told you this uh, difficulty in removing nitrogen because of these steps, because of these kinetic steps. All reaction involves several steps. It is non thermodynamically we can theoretically get to some values, but if we consider the kinetics then we will get a realistic values. So, from the kinetics we know that for getting a good amount of degassing particularly for nitrogen, we must control oxygen and sulfur in liquid steel. Now, I have talked about three essential requirements of secondary refining. I talked about good deoxidation, why it is necessary. It is necessary to get good cleanliness, dissolved oxygen should be low, total oxygen also should come down because if you allow the you know alumina inclusions or the deoxidant to float up and get absorbed. I have talked about good desulfurization why it is necessary because the sulfur dissolved sulfur soluble sulfur must come down in liquid steel. So, our liquid steel should have less sulphide inclusions. So, you know the inclusion level should be less it is more clean steel. I have talked about why hydrogen and nitrogen level must be brought down, how it is brought down in secondary refining. Before degassing why deoxidation is necessary, desulfurization is necessary. So, now let us come to some typical examples of secondary refining, how it is done in reality, actually how it is done. I have talked about to you ladle furnace is a very common you know secondary refining process. Now, let us see what is happening in ladle furnace. We, we know that we have to tap the liquid steel from BOF EF that means from the primary stage we are tapping liquid steel in a ladle. We are taking care that slag from the primary you know uh, stage should not come, should be restricted, preferable should not come, it has to be controlled within very small amount in the slag because it has FeO, it has MnO, it has P2O5 all these oxides are undesirable in the ladle. So, they should be cut off, the primary slag should be cut off, there should be no carryover of this slag in the ladle. Now, when you have got a ladle, now you can do secondary refining in a ladle, I have mentioned this. Secondary refining processes are done in ladle. So, now this ladle first gets into this ladle furnace chamber. In this chamber, the whole chamber can be 
it can be little can be put in this inside this you just see whatever facilities are there you see there are you know electrodes graphite electrodes which can be inserted in the ladle so that means the possibility of heating up is there you can do lot of additions in the ladle why additions are necessary because you know you have to form a good amount good basic slab basic slag in the ladle how do you form so you have to add some calcium oxide maybe some small amount of calcium fluoride if necessary so for slag formation some addition is necessary for getting a good um, uh, you know the desired chemistry some addition of ferro alloys may be necessary maybe you have to adjust manganese maybe you have to adjust silicon maybe you have to adjust other alloying elements whatever or the requirements in the particular grade so some addition for of ferro alloys for getting you know the desired chemistry is necessary maybe you have to adjust the carbon and small amount of you know, some coke addition may be necessary for adjust for getting the desired carbon level so all these additions are possible in ladle furnace so what else is possible then you have to add some aluminum you know for getting good deoxidation so deoxidation heating desulfurization chemistry and slag adjustment you are adding ferro alloys and co all these are carried out in ladle furnace everything is possible in ladle furnace except degassing degassing is not possible because it is not under vacuum so except degassing deoxidation is possible heating is possible desulfurization is possible chemistry adjustment is possible now what is the average slag composition this is again roughly i am telling you the, it may be there may be variation, variation of 3 4% so calcium oxide is about 55% i have told you that for getting good desulfurization you must have good basicity so calcium oxide is about 50 to 55% alumina is about 25% where from alumina is coming because we are adding aluminum for deoxidation so alumina is a deoxidation product so there is is a good amount of alumina in the slag we we have some amount of silica in the slag we may have where from silica is coming if there is some silicon some uh, you know as deoxidant that means some amount of silica may form as deoxidation product is roughly about 8% may vary from maybe 6 to 10% then some amount of mgo is there in the slag where from it, it is coming it is interesting this is coming from the burnt dolomite which is the ladle lining it is a, you know there is a refractive lining this is called the ladle lining here this portion ladle lining it is made of burnt dolomite so some amount of mgo might come and why might it actually comes from you know from this refractive erosion so some amount of mgo will be there in the slag now this is interesting look at here i have told you there is a possibility of argon purging injection of argon in the ladle so we call it argon purging you know there is a possibility that ingon i sorry argon will be injected through the porous plug this is the porous plug at the bottom so through this porous porous plug argon can be purged you know you see these argon bubbles are rising so how much argon you purge also there is a theoretical you know calculations uh, i will try to uh, talk about it separately later on but please try to understand the argon purging facility is there in all ladles so there is a uh, you know presence of porous plug at the bottom of the ladle through that you can push argon you can inject argon and this helps in circulation in the bath you know this helps in homogenization of the bath this helps to float facilitates to float the alumina inclusions which are forming by deoxidation reaction to go and go, uh, to float go up and get absorbed at the slag level so this is very important this helps in bath stirring temperature homogenization is possible so in ladle furnace i am trying to talk about what are the possibilities are there deoxidation is possible heating is possible because you know 
this graphite electrodes are there, they, they are used for heating. So, whenever there is a temperature drop, we can use the argon electrodes, we can create an arc, we can increase the temperature of the liquid steel. We can do desulphurization because the slag is good, slag is you know uh, is uh, useful, this is so much of calcium oxide is required for good desulphurization, so it is possible. So, chemistry adjustment is possible, you can add ferro alloys, slag adjustment is possible as I have told you, you know calcium addition, calcium oxide addition has been there. So, all these facilities are there in lateral furnace except degassing, many things are possible to be done. Now, let us go to another you know secondary refining furnace or secondary refining possibility of the process which is known as RH, I have told you RH degasser is also a common secondary refining process. Now, what does it do? The name suggests RH degasser, that means degassing is possible, that means there has to be a vacuum, possibility of creating vacuum, then only degassing is possible. So, what it does, this is very interesting, this is somewhat different from the other degassing processes. I have told you there may be VD, that means vacuum degassing, there may be a VAD process, that means vacuum arc degassing, where along with degassing you can create arcing, that means you can increase the temperature. Here we call it RH degasser, that means degassing is possible. So, how degassing are we are doing? This is interesting, this is called circulation degassing process. Unless VD and VOD, where you know there is a vacuum chamber, we are putting the, uh, what is that called? The ladle, we are taking the ladle where the liquid steel is there, inside the vacuum chamber and we, we are evacuating using the pump, so the vacuum is created and degassing is that in the process degassing will be there. But here you just look at what is happening, there is a vacuum chamber. So, from the ladle liquid steel, there are two legs of the vacuum chamber, you will call snorkel, this is one leg, this is another leg. So, this leg, the left leg in the figure, what is happening there? With both are immersed in the liquid steel in the ladle. The rising and expanding bubbles of argon. So, we are pushing argon from this you know opening in the this leg in this snorkel, left snorkel of the vacuum chamber. So, how does argon help? This bubbles of expanding rising and expanding bubbles of argon, they facilitate lifting liquid, there is a pumping action. They will pump the liquid steel in this chamber, you see they will pump up. So, the liquid steel will be lifted in vacuum chamber, this is a vacuum chamber. The liquid steel is lifted in the vacuum chamber, formation of liquid steel droplets, that means the liquid steel will, there will be droplets of liquid steel will be created by this action and consequent degassing. As I had told you how degassing takes place, degassing is taking place from the at the interface of the liquid steel and the gas, gaseous surface. So, if you can create droplets of liquid steel, this degassing reaction is enhanced because small droplets, so the you know transportation of hydrogen, nitrogen from the bulk to the interface will be enhanced because you have a small droplet, you know the, uh, the distance of transport or the distance, distance of travel for hydrogen and nitrogen will be less because of small droplets. They will be going to the surface and the droplets are present in the vacuum chamber. That means, at the surface of the droplets of liquid steel, there will be reaction from nitrogen in liquid steel to the gas of nitrogen or hydrogen going into the vacuum chamber, vacuum phase. And since the vacuum is there, the this reaction that means from atomic nitrogen to liquid nitrogen or atomic hydrogen, or sorry, not liquid nitrogen to gaseous hydrogen, the the reaction of atomic nitrogen to uh, gaseous nitrogen, atomic hydrogen to gaseous hydrogen, they are enhanced in vacuum. So we are creating first we are using the argon 
gas, argon bubbles, we are creating droplets of liquid steel, we are pumping up droplets of liquid steel, sending it to the vacuum chamber. So, these small droplets at the interface of the small droplets, this reaction, you know, solid gas reaction of nitrogen atom to nitrogen gas, hydrogen atom to hydrogen gas will take place and the vacuum will enhance this reaction. So, there is an excellent bath circulation is possible because the whole bath is getting circulated because of this process. Liquid steel is going up and finally coming down here through this the other snorkel, the other portion of the vacuum chamber. So, it is going up as you know uh, argon gas is sent through this you know channel, sent through this orifice. So, it is going up through this snorkel after the reaction it is coming down through this snorkel that there is a continuous circulation of liquid steel in the ladle to the vacuum chamber. In the process the extent of degassing is very good, it is quite helpful in this way. So, I have talked about today desulphurization, how desulphurization takes place. It is I have told you this is basically a slag metal reaction. So, the sulphur which is present in the liquid steel will react with calcium oxide present in slag to generate calcium sulphide that means, the sulphur is going from the liquid steel to the slag as calcium sulphide and oxygen is also getting generated and coming into the liquid steel. So, calcium this reaction indicates that calcium oxide in slag has to be high, oxygen in liquid steel has to be low then only desulphurization is very successful. I have talked about what is known as sulphide capacity, it is a wet fraction of sulphur in the slag in the form of calcium sulphide divided by the wet fraction of sulphur present as element sulphur in the liquid steel. So, the ratio of this gives an indication of the desulphurization possibility and also or the you know the how effective is the desulphurization, this is known as LS known as the sulphide capacity at equilibrium level. And as I have told you this is since this is proportional to wet fraction of CO, so more is the CO more is the desulphurization and it is inversely proportional to weight of weight percent of oxygen in liquid steel. So, less is the weight percent of oxygen better will be the desulphurization. So, deoxidation is a must before desulphurization to bring out uh, to to bring down the amount of oxygen in liquid steel. Then I have talked about degassing, how hydrogen and nitrogen can be removed using vacuum. You know this reaction takes place, this is a reaction at the interface of liquid and gas. Hydrogen and nitrogen as element present in the liquid steel goes to the gaseous hydrogen and nitrogen as molecule and removed in the gas phase. So, this reaction it depends on the partial pressure of hydrogen or nitrogen which is lowered by using vacuum. So, vacuum can vacuum level less is better is the vacuum that means, low is the partial pressure better is the degassing. But these are I have talked about the theoretical solubility limits and I have given you some values from the theory what should be the level, but then I have also talked about that for hydrogen more, more or less the theoretical limits that can be achieved, but for nitrogen the amount of degassing is not good is only to the extent of 30 to 40 percent because of the kinetics, because this mass transfer of nitrogen in liquid steel is slow, the, uh, the you know reaction at the uh, surface interface between liquid steel and gas is slow and the mass transfer of nitrogen and gas is also slow. So, to enhance this denitrogenation that means, it has removal of nitrogen, this control of oxygen and sulphur is essential because oxygen and sulphur is very surface active. So, if they are present in liquid steel in large amount, they will preferentially go to the surface and at the cost of nitrogen. So, the removal of nitrogen gets slow. So, this is the uh, requirement that means, oxygen and sulphur first deoxidation and then good desulphurization are essential for getting good amount of nitrogen. Then I talked about you know in ladle furnace how what are the possibilities. Then I talked about 
in RH, which is circulation degassing process, how very good bus circulation is possible and good degassing is possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>